Now, uh, given that I would like to restrict myself to about one hour's filming per day, if, if I don't want to take many years to reach PhD 2 level, second year PhD, so that implies that the number of um, exercises that I solve in the problem solving session will be reduced somewhat to say two, three, four, that, that kind of order, uh, less than before. I need to be more disciplined with my time. Uh, okay, so let's do two theorems now. Uh, one fairly easy, uh, the second one not so easy. The second one will make you think. Uh, so theorem 20, 23, remember uh, Barnard, he just numbers his theorems uh, starting at one at the beginning of the book right through to the end of the book, it seems up to about 80 something. Okay, so this is theorem 23, and I'll just state it to you. Uh, if you have a cyclic group, every subgroup of that group, of that cyclic group, is abelian. Okay. Every subgroup, every subgroup of a cyclic group is abelian. Does that seem intuitively obvious to you? I mean, just given each element is a power of some generator. Um, now remember, a bit of revision, an abelian group is what? So abelian, that means for any x, y belonging to your group, x binary operator y is equal to y binary operator x. In other words, they commute, right? For, for all possible pairs. Okay? Right? Now, uh, so let x... Now x and y, they're just members of this uh, cyclic group. So each of them can be expressed as some power of the generator. So g to, oh no, let's say m, and y will be g to the n, let's say. Where m, m and n are some integer, right? some integer power. Well, uh, you may be getting to see it already. Okay, so x, y. Just multiply these two, so it's g m g n, and that's uh, g of m plus n. Just you know, just exponents. Okay. Now uh, integers are com you know they commute, so m plus n is the same as m plus m. Okay, so this is just n plus m, and you can split this up, so this then becomes g to the n g to the m, okay, but what is g to the n? Well, it's y. g to the m is x, and there it is, x, y equals y, x. And that's true in general for any any two elements of your group, right? So it's quite general. Um, so this, uh, this, subgroup, well, here, yeah, let's call it h. Call this H, it's a subgroup. Okay. H. But uh, it's a general proof. Alright, uh, now the next one, theorem, theorem 24, uh, quite a bit more difficult. Imagine, I don't know, when would it be? I'm not quite sure when, when this, was, this particular theorem was proved for the first time. I don't, I don't know enough about it. Of the, the, the detailed history of this subject to, to, to tell you, but uh, I'm guessing, let's say, early, let's say early, early 20th century. But anyway, we're, imagine you're a research mathematician, you're sitting in your armchair, you, you have a, a notepad on your lap, and you know about the idea of subgroups, you know about the idea of cyclic groups. I don't know. The, the topic of this and the previous lecture. So, the obvious question probably comes to your mind, hmm, subgroups and cyclic groups. So, if I take a subgroup of a cyclic group, is that subgroup itself 
cyclic? Okay, do you get, get the question? And you're, just, you're combining these two ideas, if you like, the idea of a subgroup, the idea of a cyclic group. But is the subgroup of a cyclic group, is, is that subgroup itself cyclic? And you may be suspicious that it is. But uh, imagine now you're, you're that research pure mathematician and you're trying to prove that, that your suspicion is, is true. So how, how would you go about actually proving it? So uh, I'll think aloud. So I'm imagine, uh, now I'm imagining I'm, I'm sitting in this armchair and I'm thinking, gosh, uh, and this is the hardest part. It's always the hardest part, trying to figure out an approach when you're trying to prove something. How, how would you begin? to prove a thing like that? Well, uh, you, jot, you jot down thoughts, you know, things that you know are true. So what do you know? Like, here's, here's your cyclic group, big G. Okay? And here's your subgroup, H. And uh, so this subgroup must contain the unit element, right? because it's a group, all groups have a unit element. And you know the group contains only one unit, that was a proof a theorem we proved uh, a while back, a couple of lectures back. So that one unit uh, must be in H, and there's no other unit uh, outside H in G. Okay, it must be there. Now, if, if your subgroup is the trivial uh, subgroup, so, so it's just this. So if H is just uh, the set of the unit, the so-called trivial subgroup, then that's, that's cyclic. That's cyclic, right? Uh, the whole group, there's only one element. So, the, uh, so E to the 1 is equal to E. Okay? So the order of the element, element, the order of the element is 1. Okay? And the order of the group is also 1. So there's this rare case where the two... The two are the same. All right, so so E is cyclic, but say say there are now there are other elements in this group. Okay, uh, we're using a Venn Venn diagram here. So these these other elements they belong to H, but they also belong to G, right? So since G is cyclic. These, these x's that belong to uh, h also belong to g, right? And therefore, these x's must take the form uh, that generate... Oh, by the way, uh, g, g is this, okay? You assume, assume that little g, little g here is the generator of g, because you, you know that big G is uh, cyclic, right? So it has a generator. Uh, we'll call it little g. So, um, so these elements here, x, right? these, these elements here that belong to the subgroup, they must take this form. Okay? And n, n is an integer. That, that, that must be true. Alright? Well, we know that much. Okay, so we we jot, we jot that down. So whatever, whatever these elements in H are, they must, they must be of this form. Okay? And N, N is just you know, some integer. We know that that's true. Uh, so you keep thinking, and what else, what else could you come up with? Well, all of all except you know, except for E, all all of these elements here belonging to H are of this form. Okay. Now one of them, one of them will be the smallest. Like this, this the value of this integer here will will be the smallest, right? So uh, let's let let that, that begin. Let let that be like little n. Okay. So this let, let's 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 say it's this one. So this this one here. It's of the form g to the little g to the n, okay? and we're assuming of all these all these elements here, this m this m 
it's the smallest power. Okay. And you're thinking, all right, if this this m here is the smallest power, then maybe that is the generator of h. Now, what I've just said is quite profound. It's like the heart of the proof, if you think about it. Um, do you, need, you want me to say it again? You, you, you look at each of these uh, elements and you find one of them where the power, its power of the generator, little g, m, the, that m is the smallest one of, of these. And your suspicion is that that g to the m is the generator of this subgroup, H. Okay? That's, that's your suspicion. So let's, let's just call this A. So A. Now, if, if this subgroup H is cyclic, by definition, it means it has a generator. Right? That's, just, that's what a cyclic group is. It has a generator. You can uh, generate or create all members of your group from the generator, just, just by raising the generator to, to powers, integer powers. Okay? So here's, here's the hypothesis that H, H equals question mark.